I have to mention that last song of worship, God with us. And he lifted me up and he lifted. I thought of this verse. I had to read it for you guys. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it in fear and trust in the Lord. He lifted me up. Hallelujah. I love that song because it's not like I, I love the words. I love the reality that he did that in my life. You know what I'm saying? And so I think of 2016, how many times did, did I fall in my own strength, but he lifted me up. I pray 2017 would be even more so. Amen. So today is the title, New Year's, a real New Year's resolution. Now, first service, um, we had a little bit different crowd, less people. Not many people did New Year's resolutions, which was shocking to me. Raise your hand if you commonly do New Year's resolutions each year. So strange to me. I always have. I always have. And I'm one of those advocates, like, let's do it. You know, I like to reflect on the past year. And look forward to the next year. And I always ask the Lord for vision, uh, clarity on what he's calling me to do. Now, I looked at some statistics. Over all Americans, 62% of Americans do New Year's resolutions every year. 62%. Now, obviously, that doesn't apply here because I guess you guys are too spiritual for that. But anyway, um, I'm, I guess I'm the only one. Um, you know, so 62%. And here's some of the New Year's resolutions, right, of the top 10. I'm not going to list all of them, but number one, lose weight, right? Um, this is the time of the year where the gyms make a lot of money, and, but don't get much fuller. They make a lot of money because all these people are like, I'm signing up, I'm going to pay that you know, entire year, um, an entire year membership, and then I'm only going to go for the first month or maybe the first couple of weeks. I've seen many people during Christmas time and Thanksgiving stuffing their faces with desserts and they go, well, it's okay because I'm going to do a, you know, working out on January 1st. And so there's this justification to make yourself feel better, you know, and that's what New Year's resolutions are often about is this, wow, this makes me feel better, the thought of change. Man, I really think it would be good to change. This makes me feel good. Um, so another one is getting organized. Number three, spend less save more. Can I get an amen on that? We need that. Number six, learn something exciting. Number eight, help others in their dreams, which is awesome. And then number nine for the college students, fall in love. That is your number one uh, resolution, right? Number 10, spend more time with family. Okay, so these are all good and all. As um, far as the church, often New Year's resolutions are spend more time, alone time with the Lord, go to church more, evangelize more, um, witness to your family members who aren't saved, so on and so forth, which are all good things. So out of, out of all the people that make new resolutions, there's a shocking number that actually do it. An amazing number of 8% actually go through with their New Year's resolutions. Pretty sad, right? Pretty, pretty pathetic. Well, I want to talk about a real New Year's resolution. Now, look at the, a passage with me, Proverbs 19, that says, If you listen to advice and are willing to learn, one day you will be wise. People may plan all kinds of things, but the Lord's will is going to be done. That's a real smack in the face, right? So we make all these plans in our own strength and our own efforts, but it says the Lord's plan will be done. And the reason that is, is because we often make our plans not God's plan, our plan. We don't, we don't ask him, Holy Spirit, what is your plan for our life? So I was, uh, last night I went to bed early. Last night on New Year's Eve, I'm studying to preach the word. That's how much I love you guys. I was with my, with my wife and I was thinking, I'm like, I can't believe I'm doing this right now. I was like, six years ago, I was getting hammered and wasted every single New Year's Eve. And now I'm praying and studying your word. Lord, you change people, God. You're so good at changing people. If someone were to prophesy to me six years ago that, hey, six years from now, you're going to be preaching at a church that's growing and God's working instead of getting drunk, I would have thought they were crazy. Maybe you can reflect in the past in your own life and say, that was before God, but after God, everything's changed. So I'm studying and praying and reflecting on this, and I'm like, you know, in 2016, it wasn't the easiest year. It was an amazing year, but it's never easy. I, I look at even a lot of your faces. I know some of the circumstances you guys have been through in 2016. There's been some difficult stuff that's gone on in your guys' life in 2016. Wow. And it makes me cry out, Lord, I need help. 
My number one prayer, I pray at least a dozen times a day is, hear me, Lord, help. It's a great prayer. It works. I pray it, I mean, every time that I'm counseling someone, they're sharing their heart with me, I'm praying, Lord, help. What do you have for them, Lord? Lord, help. Every time I'm up here in the stage preaching, Lord, help. Every time I want to love someone, I know I can't love them. Lord, help. Every time I'm in the kitchen trying to cook, I say, Lord, help. Everything, <laughs> Lord, help. And you see, John 14, 26, Jesus says something. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. It's the Holy Spirit's name, helper. That's awesome. I'm so happy about that. And, and because it's his name, I know it's in his very nature to help people, to help mankind. So I no longer need to beg Please help. I can come in confidence saying, Lord, I know you want to help, but the truth is, guys, sometimes we don't want the help. It's not that the Holy Spirit isn't helping. It's part of who he is. He can't do anything but help. He's the Holy Spirit. It's in his very nature, but we don't always want it. So I want to talk about 2017. In the next um, series, Spoken Light, which will start January 21st, we're going to be casting vision for our church for the next year. Without vision, our people perish, right? So I'm all about vision. I think it's very important. And I want to talk about what we should look forward to in 2017 and how we need help getting there. I need a lot of help. You need even more help. We need help. I I need so much help, guys. Pray for me. Every day I need the the grace of God. So let's get started. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're going to have fun. You're going to learn a lot. Um, you're going to learn a lot. But I taught the first message. So many people were like, wow, it was meaty. Lots, lots, lots of different passages. And we're going to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit. So first point I want to make is the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not an it. Okay, look at this passage. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So not it will tell you, but he. He is the third person of the Trinity. So I hear all the time um, people come to me, of course, well-meaning. It's not bad heart or anything. They come to me, and they're excited because they felt the presence of God. And they're like, I felt it. And I always have to bite my tongue not to correct that. I'm like, you mean him? You felt him? Um, and, and what I find with a lot of young believers is that they find, they, they think they discover more about the Holy Spirit watching Star Wars with the force and everything. Like it's some mysterious, like distant force that moves. No, not at all. The Bible, we can learn about the person of the Holy Spirit from the Bible. And that's what we're going to do today. It's going to be awesome. So he is a person. He needs to be worshiped. And unfortunately, I want to show you this book. It's called Forgotten God. We know who Francis Chan is, right? Of course you don't. You love that. You love that book. So in this book, um, it's essentially it's saying that in the American church, we've left out the Holy Spirit. I mean, praise God that even in our songs, we talk about the Holy Spirit. That's awesome. But a lot of you never even see Holy Spirit in any of the teaching, any of the songs, anything. So, so they kind of practice... Uh, Christianity in a way where it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible, which is, of course, wrong. It's, it's, it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and there's a lot to be said about the Holy Spirit, and, and he's the one that ministers to us in our life. So look at this passage with me. First John chapter 5 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, some of you don't understand the Trinity at all, and I would say join the club because no one truly understands altogether, but you don't have to understand it all to believe it fully, you see. So I, I'm, I'm not going to do a whole sermon t- uh, teaching on the Trinity, though that would be fun, um, but the point is, is the Holy Spirit is God. Now, the very first time the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the Bible is the second verse. In Genesis chapter 1 where it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The very last time, which is in the end of uh, the book of Revelation chapter 22, says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. 
And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Now, we see all the first time the Holy Spirit is mentioned and the last time. And guess what? There's a whole lot of activity in between. The Holy Spirit has done a lot of ministry, changed a lot of people's lives, and there's a lot to be known about him. So I want to get into that. Some of the ways and characters in the Bible and how the Holy Spirit worked, and also the attributes and characteristics of the Holy Spirit. So um, you know how a lot of people pray, especially in Pentecostal churches, they go, in the name of Jesus, right? I pray in the name of Jesus, and they have to say it three times. If you say it with the right oomph, like Jesus, then they're definitely going to be healed, you know? And, and that kind of thing. Well, what they're thinking there is there's this, there's this me- like power if you say J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. But the name of Jesus is the character. Name equals character. So the Holy Spirit has different names, characters, characteristics all throughout Scripture. So I want to list just six of them real quick um, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So number one, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is the spirit of glory. 1 Peter 4, 4 uh, verse 14 says, If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. That word glory is weightiness and majesty. So we know that we are persecuted for righteousness sake, for Christ's sake, the the spirit of glory rests upon us. Second, my favorite out of the six is the spirit of life. Romans 8, 2 says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Praise the Lord. I, uh, I remember like it was yesterday, when I was radically changed in a day, but like a, like a Saul turned to Paul kind of thing, just radically changed, and I was like, this is life. As soon as the Holy Spirit touched my life, my friends, I was forever changed because I was like, I was searching my entire life trying to find some substance, some, some truth, some life, but it was really just death. And all of a sudden, when the Holy Spirit came in, I was filled with life. You know, there's areas in your lives in 2016 that have been dead. Dead bones. You know what you need? You need the Holy Spirit to come and bring life. The answer isn't better discipline, behavioral modification. It's that the power of the Holy Spirit would come and do what only he can do and minister life into your circumstances. Because that's what he does. Number two, he is the spirit of life. Number three, the spirit of truth. John 16 verse 13 says, However, When he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. I believe a lot of people resonate with um, the spirit of truth. Because, you know, your entire life, you're thinking this one thing is true. And then the Holy Spirit comes in, you go, wow, I was wrong. It's kind of like you were walking in a desert where it was just dark all the time and then this big flashlight comes on and lets you be able to see and now you can see the truth. And we know that the truth sets us free. So one of the things also about the spirit of truth, which a lot of Christians miss, is also to show us what's best rather than what's good. You see, because the devil will want us to settle for something good when God has something best. So the Holy Spirit is that discerner of truth. And we have to remember something, that the Holy Spirit is God, so he knows everything. So, so let's say you, you meet someone today new in church, right? You should pray, Holy Spirit, show me truth about this person. As far as like, I want to speak into their life. Every time. He knows it's not difficult for him to tell you. We just have this mindset, like we don't, we don't acknowledge the presence of God moment by moment. Because when you do, you'll see him activate you in different parts of ministry that you never have in your life. So he is the spirit of truth. Number four, the spirit of holiness. Anyone watch the news in here? We need some holiness in this country. Man. I, I mean, it's not, you don't think of purity and holiness when you think of today's culture, 
right? But the Spirit of God brings holiness. Romans 1.4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Hallelujah. Number five, the Spirit of grace. I was uh, praying this morning, and Keith Green, if you didn't know Keith Green, awesome songwriter, artist in the 1970s, no longer alive, but his music's still around. And um, he sings a song called... Grace by which I stand. That if it were not for, for grace, I surely would have fallen. Wow, that's so heart piercing that we would know, you know what, in 2016 in the past, there's no way we could have walked in purity. There's no way we could have loved our spouse, loved our children if it were not for grace. You see, and grace is the empowerment to do the impossible. A lot of people look at grace as, well, I can sin and grace will cover. No, no, no. Grace is the ability to do righteousness, but actually love it. It's where there's an impossible task, and, and we can't reach it. We can't reach over that cliff, but then grace comes in and lifts us up. You see, and the Holy Spirit brings that in our lives. He's the empowerer for whatever we have to do that God calls us to. I mean, you know, everyone that's married here, you can't love your spouse on your own. It, you, you just can't. You fail over and over again because love is you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything for me and I will still love you fully. No, no married couple is like that outside of the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? So and I'm, I'm married almost a year and I've learned that much. You know, it, it's really about the grace of God and everything. How are you supposed to raise your children in a godly way? The grace of God. So you need the spirit of God to take over your life. Number six, the spirit of Christ. Romans 8 verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to the entire world who Jesus is. Every, everyone, he, he wants, and it's not a man-made uh, teaching of Jesus. It's not this doctrine that we hear often today that's wrong. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal Jesus in all of his glory and all of his splendor. And he's always about that. So, I don't know, a year or so ago, I was studying on the person of the Holy Spirit for probably like every day for three months or so, something like that. And I remember just as I was studying, I, I, I kept thinking about Jesus all the time. I was like, wow, Jesus, you're so amazing. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. And I just clicked, like, wait, the Holy Spirit is all about lifting up the name of Jesus, all about glorifying him. So when you hear, like, spirit-filled believer, every spirit-filled believer is about glorifying Jesus because it's the spirit of God's agenda to lift up the name and the work of Jesus Christ. You must know that. All right, so those are six things. There's many more, but those are the six that I chose for today. Um, now I want to get into how the Holy Spirit has worked throughout creation, throughout mankind. Now, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Amen? So that means the Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But the way that he has ministered and worked to mankind has changed throughout time. So we're going to get into that. First passage I want to look at is Judges chapter 6, verse 34, talking about Gideon. Now, if you know a little bit about Gideon, he was a, a kind of a coward, a fearful man. But before he showed any courage whatsoever, all he had was fear. The Lord called him mighty man of valor. And then something took place. And then something took place. Here we're going to read it. But the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Then he blew the trumpet, and the Abzurites gathered behind him. He came upon Gideon. I wanted to find that word for you. Okay, so I have a glove here. When I put this glove on, you no longer see my skin, right? All you see is the glove. That word upon, right, in the Hebrew means to fit on like a glove, which means that the Holy Spirit came upon Gideon in a way that you no longer saw Gideon but you saw the Holy Spirit. And we're actually called as believers to live the same way, that the power of God would come rest upon us, that people of the world would no longer see you, but they would see the presence of God. 
So when I, think, when I think of marriage, part of the problem of so many marriages is people are giving their spouse them. And they're not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and giving their spouse daily the presence of God. Um, so with Gideon, here he's a fearful man, but something totally shifted as soon as the presence of God came upon him. Um, about, I, taught, I taught a sermon on Sunday about three or four weeks ago or something like that. And, um, and I was teaching on uh, the face of Jesus and how it, when he lit his countenance and made his face shine upon you, it means to smile. And that just blew my mind. I'm like, that's amazing, Lord. You smile over your people. Praise the Lord. And so my prayer was, Lord, when I teach that section, I want to smile like Jesus would smile if it was coming through him. You know what I'm saying? So I, I prayed that. And I believed it, right? So I said it. He smiles over us. And I had this smile well up with me, this joy overflowing. And right after the service, someone came up to me and they go, bro, when, when you read that, when you smiled, I thought it was like how Jesus would have smiled. No joke. The point of that story is, hey, it's time for people to see Jesus, not us any longer. Too much of us in Christianity Gideon, he didn't give the Israelites himself. It was the power of God that clothed him, where you would no longer see Gideon, but you would see the power of God. Come on. That's what we're called to. That's what we're called to. So we know this story with Gideon, where it's 32,000 Israelites against 135,000 Midianites. Now, that's obviously very intimidating, but some human understanding can reason it. Well, it's like, all right, so that's one um, you know, I mean, we have to beat like, you know, five, five people, you know, one every five guys, we kill five guys, we could, we could do that. If we have better weaponry, we have better training, we can do that, right? There's some human reasoning behind that. So the Lord doesn't approve of that, he, because then man can take the glory. So what he does is he lessens it, and now he lessens it to 10,000. Then it's like, ooh, 10,000, that doesn't seem so good. That's, we have to kill 13 and a half men, every person. I mean, that's difficult. And, and so there's, but still, some people be crazy enough. We can do it. We can do it. So the Lord lessens the number even more to a number of 300. 300 versus 135,000. No one's going to think that's possible. And the Lord would say, good. That's the point. So what takes place here is the complete impossible. But remember, something happened in Gideon's life. It's the Holy Spirit came upon him. And everything changed after that. We give so much Bible character, so much credit, when they did nothing until the presence of God came upon them. It's all to the glory of God. All to the glory of God. Um, so what we see with David, um, the same type of thing where, hey, he slayed Goliath. And we're like, oh, King David. <laughs> Listen, the Holy Spirit came upon him. It wasn't David that killed Goliath. It was the Holy Spirit that killed Goliath. And um, the Lord spoke something to me this morning that I want to share with you. He said it so clearly to me. He says, I allow giants in your life that only I can slay. So here's what that looks like. Here's what that looked like is, you know, he allows trials. He allows circumstances where we go, that is impossible. And that is exactly the point the Lord wants to make. So he gives these circumstances that only he can conquer. Why? So that we would rely upon his spirit to overcome them. Happens on and on. Look at your life. Look at your path. I mean, it's just so obvious what takes place. So we'll go now to King David. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13 says, Then Samuel took the, the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David. From that day forward, so Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Now, we know King David, he still messed up, but he was a man after God's own heart. And he had the Spirit of God upon him. Now, I want to fast forward to after he committed adultery with um, Bathsheba and had Uriah killed. And then Nathan had to come and rebuke him, which is one of the funniest stories in the Bible to me. He's like, you are that man. If you know the story, every time I read that, I'm like, am I that stupid sometimes, Lord? Where like it's right in front of me and I'm missing it? So Samuel, I mean, uh, David, he prays this prayer in Psalm 51 where he says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit 
from me. Now, I, I used to sing song, that song growing up in church when I was a kid, and I realized it put a lot of fear in me, like that his spirit would leave, you know? So six years ago, when the Lord changed me, um, I was an alcoholic, so I was very reliant upon that drug, so to speak, alcohol. I just to function, to talk to people. Like, I was always angry unless I was drunk. And so the Holy Spirit entered, and I just was, like, now addicted to the presence of God. Like, I need your presence, Lord. Man, I needed God's presence. Because if it, one day without, without his grace, I'm going to fall and be, be, drink again. And so his presence, one day, I just didn't feel his presence. Not that his spirit left me, but I didn't feel his spirit. Man, that scared me. I started crying. I go, Lord, what did I do? You know, did I sin one too many times? What did I do? And there was this fear that was in me. And, and, and here's the thing. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit did leave people. Look at this passage. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. Could you imagine kings being King Saul where the Spirit of God came upon him and everything changed, everything's prosperous. And you always see that when the Spirit of God comes upon people, their entire lives shift. Nothing is the same. Like Joseph, you, you know why every place that he went, he prospered? It's because the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. Oof. That is why. And so with King Saul, the Spirit of God leaves and then he's distressed. Because the Spirit of God is no longer with him. And so David knows that the Holy Spirit leaves. He saw it happen to Saul. So he prays this. But here's what's so cool about this, this prayer. Please, Lord, don't take your spirit away from me. Is This isn't some ordinary Joe praying this. This is King David with all of the riches that you could want, with all of the army, with, with many wives, all the things that any man during that time would want. But he doesn't pray, Lord, don't take away my army. Lord, don't take away my kingship. He says, Lord, don't take away your spirit from me. In your life, is the Holy Spirit what you value most? Even more than your family, even more than any riches, than your boat that's going to, to, to perish one day. It's the Holy Spirit that we need to value the most as Christians. So we see this in, in the life of David. But now I want to get talking about Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit's favorite topic. <laughs> Let's talk about Jesus because something totally shifted. Well, everything, but in, in this topic, something shifted when Jesus came onto the scene. So John chapter 1, we know that heavens were torn open and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a dove upon Jesus. Now here John the Baptist is recorded saying this. John chapter 1 verse 29, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So here's the reality, guys. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon, but people will be people, which is mess up and sin. And the Holy Spirit would leave because they'd be grieved. But here we see a difference. We see a difference in Jesus, the sinless Savior and Messiah, that the Spirit of God came upon him, and he never did one thing outside of step of the presence of God and his leading, and the Holy Spirit never left him, was always upon him. And John says that, that it was a prophecy, that was a testament, it was a prophecy from Isaiah, that was a testament that this is the Messiah, the Holy Spirit would come upon, and not like with David, not like with Cain, not like with Saul, not like so many others where the Spirit came and left, but the Spirit would remain. You see, and this is a shadow and type for something that happens with us guys. Because when the Spirit of Christ comes within us, He remains within us. Hallelujah. Now, John chapter, and I'll get to more of that in a second. John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus says something. He says, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, very important. I know I've got a lot of verses. This, I'm getting to the, 
the punch, the big punch is building and it's getting something. For he dwells with you, but he will be in you. Okay, this is very important. People just read that and they're like, cool. But this is like monumental theology change here for many people. For he dwells with you and will be in you. All right, that word with, let's look at that word first. It's the Greek word para, paracletes. It means with or alongside, not in, okay, with. And he, remember, Jesus is saying this to the disciples who've done miracles. They've done miracles. I mean, they're, they're awesome, right? They're great guys. Uh, the Holy Spirit alongside them. Now, you know that passage, I believe it's in Matthew 7, where it says, On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy, did we not heal, did we not, all these things, and I will say to them, away from me, for I never knew you. I believe that these two passages are paralleled. Because I believe there's going to be many people, unfortunately, that sense the presence of God in the room or around them, but they never repent of their sins and have the Holy Spirit enter inside of them. See, some, some people, even in this room, the only time throughout the week you feel God's spirit is when you come to church. That's not the way that God designed it to be. It's not. You see, the presence of God manifests in this room, and he's, he's Holy Spirit para. He's with us in this room. We can sense him. There's a, you know, an unbeliever comes in. They don't know. They don't have the, the Christianese language like we do. But they say, oh, I feel more peace. Um, I feel more comfort. I, I feel more energy. I feel energy. That's, that's a lot of the term of the world is the Holy Spirit is energy because he, he pumps you up. You know what I'm saying? Like he, he energizes these dead bones. So he's the minister of life. And so the Holy Spirit comes and people feel, you know, alongside, but they don't have that personal connection with the Holy Spirit where he enters in. So my parents are anointed, and my, the enemy messed with me in my mind with this for most of my life because I felt like whenever I encountered God, it was always because of the church or it was always because of my parents' prayers or something like that. And my prayer was, Lord, I want an encounter with you and me. So when I came back to the Lord six years ago, I'll tell you what, every time there was a significant encounter with the Lord, it was always just random times me and the Lord alone. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was alone in a house, weeping, crying out to the Lord. When the power of God fell upon me, I started speaking in tongues. I didn't even know what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. But it was alone. It was God with me, but God in me, his spirit within me doing a work. And so there's a difference here Jesus is addressing. He's saying, you know, before, before I die on the cross, the Holy Spirit's with you. He's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And, and you're agreeing with the Holy Spirit, so you're doing miracles, you're doing these things, you're agreeing with his will by faith, but, but there's going to be something life-changing, that after I resurrect from the dead, what was with you now will be in you for all of eternity. So, in is the Greek word en, E-N, which means in. So I'm going to talk about salvation now, the Holy Spirit within us. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Ephesians 1, verse 13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. That word seal is awesome, right? Um, it speaks of, like, let's say that you, we, we lived 2,000 years ago in the church of Ephesus. We'd understand that as ownership and commitment, as commitment as in an engagement ring. How Paul's saying the Holy Spirit was sealed, done forever, put inside of you as a deposit and a guarantee for the day of judgment. That you, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Hallelujah. Once and for all, it is finished, sealed. What God joins, let no man separate, you see, because the two has become one. We've become one with Christ. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So in the Old Testament, we saw the Holy Spirit come upon people and then leave. In the New Testament, we see Jesus say, hey, the Holy Spirit was with you, which can also be said with the, with the Old Testament people right upon, but now the Holy Spirit will be in you. He'll be in you. And um, I want to mention something that's very confusing for a lot of people is the word filled. 
is filled with the Spirit. It's one of like the most commonly used in the church. Filled. That person's really filled with the Holy Spirit. Or that's a Spirit-filled church, which I don't like because it's not a church unless the Spirit's there. So, <laughs> and I don't like that phrase. Um, it's Ephesians 5, verse 18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. I want to explain this. This is not talking about salvation. Paul's talking to the church. He's already talking to a bunch of believers. He, in, in chapter 1, we just read, he's saying, you were past tense, born again. You were saved, past tense. Here at Ephesians 5, he's saying, hey, don't be drunk. And, and you know, most of us know what drunk feels like. It's when you don't have much control. It's just, it takes over. It influences you so much. But on the contrary of being drunk, Paul says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Allow him to influence you. So he's talking this to believers, not like you were filled in the day that you were born again and that's it. No more filling. No, it's a, a control. Let the Holy Spirit control your life. So with that said, I want us to look at the very first time a man or woman was born again in the Bible. Turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I say turn with me, but so many people use cell phones now. It should be like flip with me or, or you know, click with me. That sounds weird. Swipe with me, yeah. That sounds so weird. I don't know how I feel about that. Like, I don't, I really like having a handheld Bible. I don't know about you. Right? It's nice. This Bible I got six years ago, and um, it's pretty messed up now. It has, like, rain all over it and stuff, like, got rain on. All right. So John chapter 20, verse 19 says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said that, his hands and, his eyes, and the disciples were glad when they saw, I get a mic, saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I don't even need a mic, but I'll use it. Has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, here we go, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't it be amazing to be there that day? Context is king here. And um, I know Jesus is king, but context is king here where it says they were alone and afraid of the Jews. So here we see a bunch of men, disciples, who are saying, like, I'd never betray you, Jesus. And then they just betrayed him. And they're fearful. They're feeling like complete failures. They're afraid of their lives. I was in Israel six weeks ago, and I know the houses are not large there. So it's a small house with the 11 disciples. Or no, there's 10 because Thomas isn't there. 10 disciples. Jesus just appears. Imagine how afraid you'd be. At first, I was thinking excited. I'm like, no, that would freak me out. They were so afraid. And he says, peace be with you. And automatically, peace was uh, imputed to them. Praise the Lord. And then he does something that's it's not recorded anywhere else in the Gospels. He says, he breathed on them. It's been my prayer this week that the Lord would breathe on us. He breathed on them. And that word breathed is the word emphaseo. It's used only one other time in all of Scripture. We look at Genesis, very good, chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust in the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So here in Genesis, we see the very first living being. And then people, we all spiritually were dead. We were born spiritually dead. And then Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, after the resurrection, he breathed on them and created life again. Jesus said, right, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Right here we see born again disciples because he breathed on them. And I think, man, I'd love to be there. But I was praying to the Lord, I'd love to be there. But he says, you were because I've breathed on you. He's breathed on us. Every, when we were born again, that was the breath, the very life of God in us. Now, so we see that very clearly to me. Come, you know, talk to me after if you don't agree. That's completely fine. But to me, it's like, I mean, because I grew up 
learning about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But I'm not someone who just like listens to people, what they say, because I know myself, I'm wrong all the time. People are wrong so much. So I'm just like, you know, I need to know God's word. What do you say about this, Lord? So I was like, I'm not going to listen to the whole baptism of the Holy Spirit thing just because it's, you know, part of denominations. I want to see it for myself in the word. So that's when I started studying it. So right here, I clearly see that, man, they were born again. Uh, to me, there's no other explanation that right then and there, those disciples were born again, just like you and I were born again when the Spirit of Christ went in us. So right after that, in a different gospel, it's recorded, Jesus is speaking to the same people that he just breathed on, and he says this, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. That word endued, another translation, clothed, the same thing that we saw with Gideon. We're clothed with power from on high. So, okay, this is a little confusing for some. So here, here we have Jesus clearly saying the Holy Spirit was with you. He will be in you. And now he's going to be upon me? What is going on here? Well, it is three completely different words. Here we see Jesus say upon, which is the Greek word epi. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And he says, tarry in the city of Jerusalem. So then we look at the day of Pentecost, where many people believe that's when the first person was born again, in the day of Pentecost. So many people believe, and I believe that's false. Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, Jesus speaking, And therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time therefore restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Again, he's speaking this to born-again believers. You see, in the church, we have born-again believers not operating in the power of God. The power of God has not come upon them. Therefore, making them powerless, a.k.a. useless for the kingdom of God. They're just not operating in the power of God or the Holy Spirit has come upon them. They just shut it out. And so when I think about 2017 with all that's going on, it's all that's going to take place, we don't know, of course. We have no idea. What I do know is we need help. And what I do know with all of my heart is I need, we need the power of God to rest upon us. We really do, my friends. I think of a couple stories of even in this body, of, of you guys, what you've gone through in your life. I think of my sister Gail right here in the second row, how we were part of a home group, um, really, really great home group, right? It's so much fun. And um, we met Tuesday nights, and she was very open, I think the second evening, about her, her uh, son, who's currently in prison and was facing a lot longer sentence than the crimes that he actually committed. He was unfairly, they, were, they, had, they made a mistake, the and he was, he was serving some time that he should have, but not as much as he was supposed to. Um, it, you know, it should have been less. And so what took place is she's crying out to the Lord, Lord, please release him. This is, you know, unjust, but, you know, the police officers, they're not going to often admit that they were wrong in these, with these circumstances. So we're praying, we're fasting, and we find out weeks later that they were dropped of all charges. And he's going to be free. Praise the Lord, right? And I think of that, I'm like, wow, Gail, Gail went through so much difficulty in 2016, starting weeping, hopelessness, but God was faithful. She believed God, and the power of God did a miracle. And we look at that area of victory, and we go, wow, Lord, amazing. But then I think of my, my brother, Jason Binder, and, and his wife, Tatiana, who they were open Wednesday about their 21-year-old son just dying two weeks ago in a, in a, in a motorcycle accident. I hope, I hope you know that the people that you say hi to, that you hug, they're not just all having some easy life. There's people all around you that are really going through it right now. And that's why I want to speak over your life, that the Holy Spirit is your helper. What giant can't you slay that you continue to try to slay? Give yourself over to the presence of God upon your life. Desire to be baptized in his power. The next question so many people ask is, well, what, what next? How do I get baptized in the Holy Spirit? What does it look like? You know, that's the wrong question because, because the Bible isn't like that. It's not some 10-step program. And once you get the 10-step, you're perfect. That's never the case. So it's always different. Through Scripture, 
different forms. Sometimes someone will lay hands on them and they be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes it would be the preaching of the Word they be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can even look in this sanctuary, different people in different areas of the room where I've seen them get baptized in the Spirit of God. During worship, during preaching, during prayer. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit on my knees in the middle of my living room, crying, and then all of a sudden, I, I didn't know what it was, but I, the power of God came upon me. It, it, to me, just to me, it seemed like, um, he seemed like, um, like, like slow rain just came upon me, and, and I just felt, wow, just overcome with his power. And I um, started speaking in tongues, which I didn't even know what was going on. And also, I, I prophesied. I realized I, I had friends, and the Lord showed me when they would get saved and even gave me a vision of where we would be when I led them to the Lord. And it happened just as I saw that night. And we see that a lot in Scripture, that after someone's baptized in the Holy Spirit, they either, they either prophesy or they speak in tongues. You don't have to prophesy or speak in tongues in order to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's not like that. But it's one of the evidence. Also, it's boldness. Um, often after they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they would preach the Word, and they would declare the glory of God. So really what it's about is, it's the, first of all, it's about faith. It's about believing. It's not about all going on sight and feeling. Um, I know I know I've heard pastors say they got prayed over, they didn't feel anything. It's not a feeling. And then the next day the power of God came upon them and everything changed. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so maybe your heart's been stirred this morning. And you go, you know what? When I look at the past year, I have not been operating in the power of God. The Holy Spirit has not been upon me. I know he, he lives within me, but the power of God that shifted Gideon's life and shifted David's life and shifted every apostle's life where they were once fearful, but then something happened. The Holy Spirit came upon them and they were forever changed. That doesn't look like my life. I, I would cry out to God and believe by faith, say, Lord, I want that. I want your spirit to come upon me in power. I want your fullness. And you yield, you surrender yourself to him and believe in faith. Now, some of you have prayed that and you've given up because it didn't happen within the first week that you prayed it. I encourage you to, to desire. Remember, he says, come freely, all who desire, all who desire. Now, we're about to close. If the worship team could come up, we're going to sing a song um, called Spirit Move. And, and our desire going in, this is, this is New Year's Day, my friends. We want to go into this year and say, Holy Spirit, move in my life. I want so much less of me and so much more of your spirit. And we have these examples of scripture where the spirit of God came upon and everything changed. Some of you, your new written year's resolution might be for a better marriage, that your life would change in marriage. Guess what? The power of God come upon your life. More so than discipline, more so than effort, the power of God needs to come upon your life. Please stand with me as I, as I read this last passage. This is my real new year's resolution where it says in Zechariah Chapter 4, verse 6, it says, So he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Father God, if we lift our hands to you, Lord, we just, we glorify you and we ask, Holy Spirit, would you come now? Would you come and rest upon us, God, and overshadow us, Lord? Be our God. Be our everything, Lord. We're so sorry for doing things in our own strengths, Lord, and trying to slay these giants on our own, God. We say, to the Lord, you alone are powerful. God, with us, things are <laughs> impossible, but with you, nothing is impossible. You are the God of impossibilities. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And we ask right now this last song, we would cry out for your spirit. Holy Spirit, come in this place and overshadow us and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.